by myself a lot, but it's always nice to have people um, make the time go by a little bit faster and enjoy uh, sharing with them. But uh, Shirley's sister Nancy was a missionary for many years in this district, and so I grew up with all of her newsletters and all of her pictures. You remember slides? You know, you push the button and it goes around the wheel and it shows the picture. Okay, we still have all of those, by the way. We're not really sure what to do, but we don't want to get rid of them. But those pictures are pictures that called me into the mission field. And I knew I was going to go overseas, but I said, God, I'll go anywhere. Just don't ever send me to Africa. Because she was in, in Senegal, West Africa for many years, Mozambique, and in a term in Portugal as well because of medical reasons. But um, all her stories had to do with snakes and spiders and rats and being hot. And I'm like, I don't like any of those things. So please don't ever send me there. And she always had such a heart. And God used her in that. And I loved it. But I'm just like... I'm just not comfortable there. And then she said, you go to Africa, you fall in love with Africa. So I said, okay, I'll fix that. The only way to do that then is you just don't go, right? So if anybody ever asked me, I would say, no, yeah, no, that's not going to work. And um, So I actually went to North Central Bible College, became a teacher. I knew I wanted to be a teacher since I was five. Um, education has always been a big thing. I love school. I love homework. I love schedules and all of those kinds of things. Um, <laughs> see, God gives us different passions, right? Different likes and dislikes and things. And so that was just kind of one of the things that God had impressed upon me. And so I went to North Central, became a teacher. And I had the opportunity to go to Brussels, Belgium for four years as a missionary associate. And um, I only signed up for one, but I actually ended up being there for four years. It was an amazing experience teaching children from 13 different countries, and I said, God, this is where I want to do missions. This is where I feel called. And I left in July of 01, 2001, came back, and I'm a licensed uh, teacher in Minnesota, and I was able to get a job there right away, which was a total God thing. And I was going to apply for full missions to go back to Belgium. Well, 9-11 took place several, a couple months after getting back. And in February of 02, the Belgian government went into all of the, the non- Belgian organizations to make sure that everybody that was there that was foreign had their visas and their working permits and one per teacher did not and she was the one that took my place. She um, got kicked out of the country. They closed down that school and that school has never been reopened since. And that totally closed the door for me to be able to go back as a full-time missionary back to Brussels. Loved it. I was crushed. I didn't know what God had for me and so I was praying, I took several missions trips, and I had gone actually to China um, for a time, I went to the Czech Republic, and was like, Lord, where is it that you want me to go with, with missions and teaching? And so uh, I had the opportunity to go into a missions pastor's office, and I said, hey, I need to get back overseas, where can I go? And he said, you know, we can get you on a plane uh, to China next week, they need English teachers. And these are ministry opportunities that you can do, and... It would be great for you. And I'm like, yeah, I would love it. I said, but it's the middle of March, and I have to finish off the school year. I said, can you wait till June? He said, no, they need you now. And we realized that it wasn't going to work for me to be able to leave to China. And by the end of the conversation, he said, well, have you ever thought of going to Congo? <laughs> and I love geography, and I knew exactly where the Congo was. And I said, yeah, no, that's not going to work. All those trips are during the school year, and I can just never seem to get those days off. I'm so sorry, it just won't work. And he said, well... That's kind of funny you say that, because this trip is only 10 days long, and it's the first 10 days of August. You'll be back in enough time to get your classroom ready for the next school year. And I said, oh, man. And um, I said what everybody says, because it sounds good, you know. And I was, in a way, thinking maybe, I said, I'll pray about it. Yeah. Right? We always say that because that appeases people. Yeah. And then do we really pray? And so I will tell you, I will be honest with you, I left his office and went out to the parking lot, sat in my car, and I did not pray. Yeah. But I called two other churches to get on another mission trip. Because if I could get myself on another mission trip to somewhere in Europe or Asia or something, then that would be great. Just not to Africa. And would you not, to both of those trips took their trips for years, like six to ten years. Every year they've been taking it. It was like consistent. Both churches canceled that trip for that summer. Like they said, oh, we know we're not taking it this summer because of the economy. We were subsidizing the trip. We don't have the money to subsidize this year, so we're just canceling it for this year. We'll see what happens next year. The second church was, oh, the missionary we work with over there is not on the field right now. They're actually back in the States, so we're not able to go this year. And I said, I'm going to Congo. Thank you. Like in my mind, I was thinking I didn't really want to speak it. And I said, Lord, if you want me to go, you provide the finances. Yes. 
And God said, okay, I just sell a couple cattle on a couple hills that I own, you know, wherever that is. Like it says in scripture, he owns cattle on a thousand hills. And sure enough, he provided the money. And, you know, we can play all the games we want with God, and we can give him all the ultimatums that we want. But when he wants you somewhere doing something, he's going to make it happen. Yeah. And there is no door that you can shut or window you can open that he doesn't want you to be. Amen? Amen. And so I did. I said, okay, I'll go. I'll do what you've asked me to do. We were going to do a VBS, kids camp, youth camps, um, work in some prison ministry, do some evangeliz evangelizing with the churches there. But I did with my heels in the ground. I said, I'm going to go. I'm not going to let it affect me. I'm going to be stone cold. Um, and then I'm going to come back and figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life kind of thing. Is kind of how I thought about it. And the first couple days was a little difficult. By the third day, I was crying. And it was because God had hit me, broke me to a point of this is where I was. And it was uncontrollable. Because then your heart softens and you realize this yes. is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And the missionaries had invited me to come back and train their teachers in their school of 1,700 students, uh, just one school, and in their children's ministry, which they have in one service, 1,000 children that come. They have 10 different classrooms with 100 kids in each room. Um, if there is not enough seats to sit, they will sit on each other's laps. Because kids want to come and learn. They want to hear Bible stories. They want to sing songs. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had the opportunity, I said, I will come back and I will do this for two years. I will give two years of my life. I did not go with an organization. Although I love the Assemblies of God, I grew up in the Assemblies of God. I said, but i got to know that this is God before I sign my name to a, a, a lifetime commitment. And so um, in those two years, it was a walk of faith. I have to tell you, there were days where I didn't eat a full meal because I didn't have the money. But God provided. I can say I didn't starve. I never went hungry. God provided for every single need, but it was one of those things that I had to walk through and trust God to, to do it. And so, um, you know, God does all kinds of things. And like I said, there's a blog on my prayer card. There's lots more stories. I wish I could tell you. I shared a bunch of stories with them um, the Thursday night that I was with them. I'll, I'm going to share some recent stories with you here today, and then we'll, we'll kind of close out. But of just how God's goodness and where he takes us, we don't always understand. You know, I went to language school uh, four years ago in, in Tours, France, uh, where I spent 11 months learning French and preparing myself. God used that whole opportunity um, to speak into lives of Muslims, of people from other countries coming to learn French, and them wondering, why are you going to Congo, an American? Why? What would you do there? And uh, so to kind of open the door to show them, you know, God can use us anywhere, any place, and this is where I feel like he's leading me. And uh, so after 11 months of language study, I, I showed up in Congo. And of course, I had friends that were already there that I had learned, um, met from two years prior. And so some of these pastors and some of these individuals, you know, we caught up with. And within the first three days, I had the director of the seminary, the theological seminary, come and say, we want you to come and teach in our Bible school. Well, my passion, my heart is education with the schools and the teachers and training them. And so I told him, I said, no. I said, are you kidding me? I just got out of language school. Like, you want me to teach at a theological seminary? Like, I didn't feel like I had the vocabulary. I didn't feel like I had the spiritual, height, heightened spiritualness of a theologian. Do you understand? Like, I'm just a simple teacher. I love kids, and I'll teach. Like, that's me. Like, I didn't think, I thought to be a, a, a professor at a seminary, you had to be like the spiritual, which you do, I guess, to a point. But you know, sometimes we just, it, I had this inadequacy yes. that I did not yes. feel like I was good enough, yeah. that I was not going to be who they wanted me to be. Yeah. And I'll tell you, the night before I had to teach three weeks, two hours a day, all in French, I cried. Because I said, I'm still not, I don't feel comfortable. Uh -huh. I don't feel like you're calling, they're going to totally laugh at me, like I'm going to be horrible. Like they're not going to understand my French, I'm not going to be understood. And, um, yeah, we have bumps and, you know, obstacles sometimes in our paths, and yet God says, I just want you to be obedient. Amen. He's like, you'll see what happens, but just be obedient and do what I'm asking you to do. But I felt so inadequate. Sometimes some of us feel inadequate, like I don't have enough education, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough time. But God just says, be obedient and let yes. me show you what I can do. Yes. And that's where our capacity limits us to what really God can do in us. 
this is, if we think about this is what our mind thinks we are capable of. This is how much money I have. This is how much education I have. But yet God says, you know what, let me take your natural and add my super to it. And I'm going to show you all the things you can do because I created you. And I know what I put in you and I know what you're capable of. And you're more capable of just this. You can do so much more. But we have to be willing to just let go and let God Amen. use us in those ways. Yeah. And so it was in that time where I said, okay, God, just use me even if I fail. Even if I look bad, I sound bad, I'm just doing this for you. And I have to say that the, it helped my French a whole lot. Because when you're under pressure, it's like the French just kind of comes out. And he puts the words on your lips. My friends, to evangelize to someone, you don't have to be, well, what do I say? What do I do? I don't know. All you have to do is say, God, I'll go. And when you get there, God's going to put it on your lips, what needs to be said to this person, whether it's a word of encouragement, whether it's a scripture verse, whether it's a prayer. What are they going to say? Oh, well, okay. All you're responsible for is what God's asking you to do. Yes. After that, it's their responsibility. If God isn't wanting to use you to continue to speak in that person's life, then he'll send you back. If not, you don't have to count. It's more about influence. What are you doing to influence people, not the numbers that you're getting? You know, sometimes it's like we want to fix things, right? We want to do it to get it over so we can move on to the next thing and fix something else. And then, and then we feel good about it, right? Well, I walked into, when I go into these schools, I um, go in and I introduce myself. And we have 550 to 600. I only made it to 85 so when I go back, I hope to do even more, but we'll see what God has in that. But I walk in and I say, you know, this is who I am. This is what I'm here for. Let me know what can I do. I would love to do a training for your school and for your teachers. And I said, but I want to ask you one question. And I asked them, where do you see your school in five years? Now, for us, five years is not very far. Like, we think, well, let's do 10, 15. Like, we want to dream big. But Africans cannot dream past today. Like, more or less, they're thinking about today, how am I going to eat today? In the schools, they're thinking about how are we going to pay our teachers transport so they come back to school tomorrow to teach. And sometimes they don't even have that money. So they'll wait till the end of the week, and the teachers have to find a way to get to school without that transport money until the end of the week. Um, it's very interesting, very creative how that happens, but that's their mindset is that they can't think ahead. So most of the time when I ask that question, they hand me a list. And the list is of all the things that they need for their school, whether it's benches, it's a roof, it's whatever. And God, and I say, you know what, I appreciate this, but I want you to dream. Where, what do you see your school? Do you want it to grow bigger? Do you want more students? Do you need a new roof? Do you need, do you want a new building? Do you want, not that they need new buildings, but like a refurnished building um, to fix certain things that are needed, like bathrooms. Do you want bathrooms in your school? And you can imagine having no bathrooms in a school is a big deal. Okay. When I asked one time walking into a school, where's the bathrooms? They're like, well, it's around the corner. So I walk around the corner, and there's no bathrooms there. It's just a wall. Mm -hmm. But it's around the corner where nobody can see. And I'm like, okay, we need to get you bathrooms. That's like hygiene. It's like, but those are the things that they're dealing with. And so I um, would do this, and they'd give me this list, and I'd say, you know, we're going to pray about these things, because I'm not here to really give you money. A lot of them is just wanting money. Yeah. And we're, let's just pray. One guy never did that, though. I walked in, he gave me the tour of his school, we talked, we walked, um, never asked for anything. But at the end he said, Madame, he's like, I need $500. And I'm like, $500 for what? He's like, we need to, a forklift to move um, two containers uh, on our compound here. And he showed the two containers were right there, and I'm like, okay. He's like, we need to build a two-room building for offices for our directors. And the offices that they're in right now, we want to turn those into classrooms because our classroom, our, our school is growing. And I'm like, well, that's wonderful. And he's like, you see the pile of bricks over there, and there's like 300 bricks already made. So now this guy has vision. This guy's already made the bricks, is ready to build the building, but these containers are in the way, and so he needs the $500 to rent this forklift and move them. And I said, you know, that's wonderful. I'm like, I'm totally going to give this guy $500. But I can't say yes because you say yes. And it's like a promise you can never break it. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been told you just don't, tell, don't say yes right away. Just think about it, pray about it, and then come back later to tell them. So I told the man, you know, I, I don't have any money to give you here right now, but let's pray about it and let's just seek God and see what he has. And he's like, okay, I want you to pray right here right now. I'm like, oh, man. Because you know what that means? I have to pray in French. And that's why the last thing I've actually 
gotten comfortable with is praying in another language. Because when I pray, I pray from deep down. And it comes out my mother tongue, which is super easy, right? Like, but it's sincere. It's got emotion, and you know that's where I feel my best. But when I pray in another language, it goes from here to here, and all of a sudden that sincerity changes. There's no emotion in it. It's just like because you're thinking about how do you translate that word into French, and so that they understand it. When you're speaking in tongues, it's the same thing. It just comes from within you, right? It doesn't come from here. It's coming from within you. And when I want to pray in French, sometimes I want to pray in tongues. But they're not going to understand yeah. anything I'm saying. And so that doesn't work either. So I'm like, oh, man, I'm sweating. I'm like, Lord, I don't – Africans can pray heaven down. Like, they'll pray for 15 minutes. And, man, there's the presence there. Boom. And I'm like, okay, and now I have to pray in French. So I'm like, all right, Lord, I have to tell you, I said the, the shortest, most simplest prayer I have ever prayed in French. And really, this is how it went. Do, Lord, help us with this need. Give us a God idea – so that we can help build the school to be the best that it can be. Yes. Like that was it. And then I said, Amen. And the guy kind of looked at me and he's like, That's it? <laughs> like, that's all you're going to say? It was like a 30 second prayer. He's like, Really? Like, you don't have anything else to give us? Like, no power, no authority, which is good. We have that power and authority, and I believe it's in our prayers, but sometimes God just takes the simplest prayers. Yes. And He uses them. Yes. And I was so embarrassed, but I was sweating bullets. I'm like, Oh man, I'm glad that's over. But man, I'm like, I need to memorize a prayer or something. Something that will work. And so I, I said goodbye to the gentleman. I said, we'll be in contact. And I went home and I went to my area director and I said, can I give this guy $500? I said, I could call two or three churches. I could get the $500 in no time. I said, I'm just going to give it. He's like, no. He's like, you're not going to give it to him. I'm like, what? He's like, just wait. I want you to wait. Because I told him the story, what I had done. And he said, nope, you're just going to wait. So who likes to wait, right? Nobody. Well, two weeks, because we want to fix it so that I can go on to the next need and fix the next need so that, that we can go on. And that's kind of how our mind works. And sometimes God's just saying, just wait. Just wait. Two weeks later, the gentleman calls me back, and he's like, Madame, Madame, he's like, we're building the building. I'm like, you got the $500? I'm like, where did you get the $500? He's like, we never got the money. He's like, but we got a God idea. Mm -hmm. Like what you pray. Yeah. God, give us a God idea. He said, we have... 50 men from our school, dads of students and men from the church that were on the same compound. 50 of them came, picked up those containers, and moved them to another part of the compound. And immediately they were able to go. And I said, God, that's you. That's all God. Amen. All they need. Yes, sometimes they need our money to get them up and moving, like up and, and get their project started. But sometimes they just need someone to come and encourage them and pray with them and to believe in faith. And for him and me, my faith was renewed. My faith Amen. was built up. Amen. Because it's not about me, and it's not about what I can do, but it's about what God can That's do right. through me, through them, right. using resources that they already have so that they can do what God's asking them to do. That's right. That's right. Sometimes we have one idea in our head, and only the only way it's going to work is if we do this one idea. And God says, no, let me show you. It's going to be in a way you never thought or even imagined. Yeah. I'm like, I never would have thought of that, but because they know who they are and who the, what they're capable of, it was like God opened that door and that opportunity, and I've shared that story I don't know how many times, but you know what? A simple prayer of faith works. That's right. So even if you've never prayed before, that's something that you can share with others. A simple prayer of faith, Lord, help me today. Yes. Give me words today. Lead me today. Heal me today. And God comes at that instant, or at his timing, and he makes it work. Now, there's someone in, in Randy's life that needs to see and hear a miracle, maybe. I don't know. But God knows. And that's why we don't have to worry. And we just pray that a peace that passes all understanding guards him and his mind and his family to help them understand this difficulty that they're going through. And sometimes when we get through those difficulties, we don't understand why did we have to go through that. Until you meet someone who's going through the same thing and you say, God was with me and he's going to be with you. Right. That's right. God knows what you're going through. God knows I know what you're going through. And because I've gone through it, I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And if you don't make it to that light, you know what? God has greater plans. And yet God always seems to show up in all different kinds of ways. It's never usually the same way. You know, sometimes we say, does God speak to you? Well, I've never really heard God's audible voice, but there's just something in here that knows if I turn this way, I'm not supposed to go that way. I need to go this way. 
And we just need to know that still small voice or that little urging inside of us or that person that God has used to speak into your life to do what he's asking us yes. to do. Amen. You know, there's so many different reasons. When they asked me to teach at the seminary and I said no, I ended up saying yes eventually. And they said we need you because um, these, these men and women that are coming to be trained are not being trained how to reach children. Children are not evangelized the same way as, as adults. And when you go to Bible college, it's more like, okay, how do you plant a church? How do you reach adults? How do you reach the community? Which is great and wonderful, but we need to know how to reach children as well because 50% of the population is 18 years old or younger. Like, I'll show a video here in just a little bit. Um, sorry, I've just kind of gotten, yeah, see what I mean? It's like 18 years or old and younger is 50% of the population, so that's the next generation of that nation. Just like the, the, we need to be praying for the next generation here. Yes. We see where our society is today. Amen. It's sad. Yes. I can't believe, after being gone for three years and coming back, I'm like, Lord, how is it that our lives have come to this? Turning on a television and seeing what I see, I, I don't even have a TV anymore because I, yeah. I can't deal with it. I'm like, really? Like, that's on a commercial? And... Some people have just come numb to it, like, well, that's just life, that's society. And I'm like, no, it doesn't have to be. That's right. Like, we don't have to, to condone that. We don't have to understand that or see that. And to protect our children from that, because they have so much that they're bombarded with already. Schools. Like, what they're wanting to teach kids in schools nowadays, I'm like, what? And just recently I heard on the radio that in New York and Boston, Pittsburgh, Chicago, they're starting singing clubs. That kids can have the option to choose to uh, do a... Because Christians are in there, they're having a prayer club, so why can't they do a Satan club? And I'm like, oh dear Jesus. Like where, and who can say no to them? Yeah. Because we have to be tolerant. We have to be... But, you know, our children need to know between right and wrong. Are we teaching them that? And that's something else that I'm a part of. Was, you know, I do all these different things, and you, you get asked to do things. I've learned not to say no anymore. So now I feel like I've said yes so many times, I'm doing like multiple things. Like I do youth conventions, I do children's crusades, um, I do education seminars where I go into churches like this and I talk to people from all gamuts of life. Whether you're single, whether you're a grandparent, you have influence on children's lives. What you speak into their life, what you show them, what you say sticks with them. Whether it's good or bad. So it's ultimately you and sometimes as parents you look at your kids and you're like, wow, they do what I do. Like they said that a lot like I said that or all my nieces and nephews, I, they remind me of my brothers and sisters. Like you were just like your mother when she was that age. The way that she would act because they are influenced by what you do, what you say. And so I am such a big um, a supporter of child evangelism and speaking and influencing into children's lives that we can literally change the next generation just by reaching out to kids. Amen. Love seeing kids in this church. Because that means this church is going to be here in 10 years. And that's what we need is because we need a church to grow through children. Children's ministry, wherever we can, wherever they come from. And they're so um, impressionable. So so vulnerable even. And yet we need them to have the, the, the word of God inside of them so that when difficulties come, they know between right and wrong. Is this the right way or is this the wrong way? Mm -hmm. And so I give education seminars talking about... Um, how Jesus was raised physically, mentally, uh, socially, and spiritually, and all the different things that they can use. Even if they can't send their kids to school, that God's given them the responsibility to teach them at home. Home is the most important place yes. to educate a child. Now, if a child from this community is not educated at home because their parents don't go to church or don't believe, then that's our responsibility as a church to bring them in and to raise them spiritually. But ultimately, if you are in the church and you're being raised, that God would use you to raise your children in such a way that um, they would know right and wrong. And so I just want to show you a quick video. I'll share uh, just a short story if I have time at the end, um, and then we'll close out. But um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to come and share with you. This video is just going to kind of give you an idea of what life is like for me in Congo, what I do day in and day out. Um, it can be very tiring at times, but God gives the extra wisdom and the extra strength through prayers of, of what you, you give. So thank you.
poorest countries in the world. Education is a means to escape the poverty, but many do not have the opportunity to go to school. Some learn to read and write. Others learn life skills from their family and in their neighborhood. Some learn a trade and find jobs. Others find work wherever they can just to feed their family. Education is not just found in the classroom, but in homes, neighborhoods, and on the street. How do we reach those that are not able to go to school? We train those in the schools and churches to reach out into their communities. Amen. 